so good evening guys okay so uh, my name is uh, deepu k shashidharan you can call me deepu i'm a solution designer for uh, tata consultancy services i'm also a core uh, j hipster uh, team member and uh, oss enthusiast as well uh, these are my profile thingies here so uh, what are we going to do today okay uh, i think most of you guys would be familiar with uh, building web applications uh, can i assume that right most of you would have done web applications at least uh, one web application from scratch can i assume that as well okay at least you know uh, how when building a web application what are the things you do if you are if you have to build it you know from scratch at least you would have learned okay so a uh, traditional way let's see what it takes uh, to build a modern web application at current uh, uh, you know for the current trends and uh, technologies so um, for the demo purpose let's see what we need to build uh, i'm taking a simple blog application a simple uh, blog where you can uh, create a blog handle for different users and uh, each each users handle can you know make post uh, create some simple tags so very simple application so um, if you have to deploy that blog as a you know uh, into a production environment and if you have to uh, you know open it up to the world then what are the features that you would need um so today since uh, responsive uh, uh, web applications are the hip thing and since uh, you you don't want to maintain different code bases for your uh, mobile and desktop and stuff so definitely you would want it to be responsive uh single page applications are all the rage uh, currently so you would want that as well security of course you would want security and uh, to be more hip you might want to have social login so that you can use your uh, facebook or you know google accounts to login instead of having to maintain uh, user accounts and uh, if you want to scale this up you might want to have distributed cache then definitely uh, being a blog application you might want to have it good search capabilities then yeah from developer perspective definitely you would want some good fast builds and uh, any of you would have uh, actually deployed uh, web applications into production uh, might have experienced what you know production optimization is and what pain it is you know so so to have your uh, production app uh, optimal and uh, performant it's 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 not a very simple task it might sound very you know uh, easy uh, when people say yeah just minify the stuff you know cache it uh, have some gzip then but it's not that simple so but we want that stuff as well and uh, just to be uh, you know hip enough uh, let's say i want uh, sql db with some versioning database versioning as well and of course i would want some automated tests i would want some performance tests i would want bdd tests all those uh, you know standard business stuff then for uh, once your application is is in, in production you would want to monitor that so you would need some metrics as well and of course you would want uh, user management audit logs and say since i am greedy i want uh, internationalization as well so what is required for uh, building that kind of an application so bootstrap is uh, the de facto for responsive these days so i would take that and uh, for spa angular is kind of the leading uh, uh, framework when you take spa so that and uh, we can have it on spring boot since that is a very good uh, you know starter framework so you can use uh, spring security for your security and since we are using spring security of course same uh, spring social for uh, social login and for distributed cache of course hazelcast and elastic search is the uh, best open source uh, you could get for your search uh, requirements and of course uh, for fast builds yes there could be people maven people here but just to be hip i'm going with gradle and uh, gulp with bow for front end management and for production optimization yes your standard gzip cache things on top of that some gulp gulp magic with uh, uglyfy minify all those stuff i would want that and for your liquibase uh, sorry and for your uh, sql versioning 
I would go with Liquibase. You could, you could uh, argue fly, fly away as well, but let's go with Liquibase here. And of course, Hibernate. And for my tests, I would go with Comma and Protractor for my automated tests so that I can do all my Selenium tests. Anyway, I'm using Angular, so Protractor goes well with that. And for performance tests, there is something called Gatling, which I could use, and Cucumber for BDD tests. So again, for uh, metrics, I could go with, since I'm on Spring Boot, I could go with Actuator and some Drop Wizard Magic. Then I could, anyway, user management, you have to build your user management, some custom code there, and audit logs and uh, uh, audit and log there. And since we are on AngularJS, we could use a library called Angular Translation for, your, for our internationalization. So what does that uh, cost me, actually? I mean, to use all this. Uh, I don't know if you, if you would agree with the uh, estimate. I'm assuming eight hours as a day. So <laughs> I'm just taking working hours, OK? So responsive, uh, having bootstrap set up and uh, having a base skeleton, that's going to take, a, take me around four hours. And uh, having Angular working and uh, all those uh, you know, base uh, uh, plugin set up and all those, it's going to take another day. So all this, security, another day. Social login, distributed cache, another day. So search, uh, elastic search integration with uh, Spring Boot and uh, having that working altogether, it's another day. And builds, of course, having Gradle, uh, Gulp, Bower, NPM, everything working together, that's definitely going to take another day. Another, I mean, uh, yeah, it takes more than a day. And production optimization as well. Uh, trust me, if you start writing uh, you know, Gulp tasks from scratch to get a proper production optimization workflow, it definitely actually would take more than two days. So I'm just putting two days there for that. And uh, Liquibase setup, again, Having Liquibase set up with all your uh, basic tables and all those things, and your uh, Gradle integration, that takes another two days. And uh, one day each for each uh, test setups, automated performance and BDD. And four hours for metrics, four hours for your custom user management. So one day for your audit setup and or your dynamic log management with uh, logback and stuff. And one day, give one day for internationalization. You know, you have to write all your JSONs for all those uh, modules as well, right? So is that it? So that, that comes around 17 days, but that's not enough, right? Uh, if you're going to expose this, you would want some nice Swagger documentation. That's going to take another four hours. And for developers, we have to be nice to the developers as well, right? They should have a very uh, nice workflow. They shouldn't be you know, doing all the hard stuff. So let's put in browser sync there. Then, yeah, we would need uh, development and production profiles as well. So that's another four hours. And yes, I want WebSockets. I want to track what my users are doing. Uh, so I, I would use WebSocket for that. And you definitely would need some entities for your, uh, since we are building a Java web app, you need some entities, right? So for the blog app, you have to design your entities and build all the CRUD for your entities. That's another day. And whatever business logic you have, that might take another day. So that's around uh, 21 days. With this, that's four weeks. But if you factor in velocity of your team, that could add another two weeks, because no team would be 100%, right? So say an approximate 60% velocity would give you another two weeks. So that's six weeks. So six weeks to you know, get started. Uh, base skeleton with all your entity uh, domains uh, set up and all your tables set up, everything that takes around six weeks. Do you guys agree, or do you think it's less? Or how many, how many of you think that? It would take around six weeks. OK, how many of you think it would take more than six weeks? OK, how many of you think it will take less than six weeks? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, so yeah, j let, let's assume six weeks for now. OK? And so. I mean, we have uh, all those cool technologies for everything. I mean, there is a new framework uh, coming out every day. Every other day, you can see a new framework you know, to ease out things. Every framework claims to ease your development or like, you know, make your life easier. I mean, Spring Boot reduces stuff to an extent. But it's still not enough to you know, uh, bring it, uh, say, this is using Spring Boot, but still takes around five to six weeks, practically. So isn't there another way? Let's, let me say that, yes, there is another way. And rather than talking about it, let me just 
let me just build that application for you. Okay, so I have this. Uh, okay, so let me do your. Uh, is it visible for you? Yes. Okay. Let me hit out uh, J hipster for you. Sorry. I'm on the latest 5.6 point something, I guess, uh, just a second. No, sorry, NPM, I think I'm on 3.7 or something. Yeah, 3.7.1, and node I'll be on, yeah, 5.5. .5. So, okay, so I have fired up jhipster. With jhipster, you uh, you get to make uh, three kind of, kinds of applications, uh, monolithic, classic, microservice or a microservice gateway. I'll go into the microservice parts later. Let's, uh, since our blog app is very simple, let's go with monolith. Uh, name of my application, I'll call it Singaso. Package. I would want, uh, you know, session based with uh, social login. That's my mechanism. And uh, of course, I'll go with SQL for this. I could go with Mongo as well, but let us go with SQL. And I'll take my SQL for production. I'll take H2 with this persistence for my development. I need Hasselcast so that I can distribute. I mean, I can have nodes of my apps with synchronized caching. And of course, I need Elasticsearch. I don't want uh, clustered sessions. I can do with my uh, normal Tomcat stuff. So no for this, and I need Spring so WebSocket, yes, and since we are hip, we're going with Gradle, and uh, yes, some SaaS magic, and internationalization, of course. Uh, I would want English as my base language. Uh, say I want Chinese and Hindi as my secondary languages, and yes, I want all kinds of tests, because testing is good. Okay, so, okay. Uh, since NPM likes to download the internet and uh, likes to take around five to six minutes normally, or even more, depending on its mood, I have cheated with, uh, I have already copied the note modules folder here, so NPM, I'm kind of cheating NPM, so it takes lesser time. I cannot wait for NPM to download the world. So that would take around, okay. That's taking more than what I anticipated. Okay. When it is running, let me just show you what is generated. So I have this demo app folder. As you can see that uh, there are a lot of folders and code generated. So you would have a Gradle folder with all the, uh, uh, you know, your Gradle files there. You have your Gulp uh, subtask there, since we are uh, using Gulp as the front end build, uh, your known modules, and all your source code is here. So there is no hidden source or there is no jar magic or like, you know, hidden jars doing stuff for you. It's all plain Java and JavaScript and HTML code there on your uh, disk, which you can do whatever you want with it, like any of your normal apps. Damn, this is taking a long. Okay, that would take a long. I'm not, I have not connected. Uh, guys, can I use your PayPal guest? Uh, yeah, sure. You know Safe the password. Payments. S A F E. C F E. Capital S. Capital S. No, uh, safe payments. Yeah. Oh, payments. Yeah. Capital S, capital P. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry for that. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you and I'm sorry for that. Okay, so NPM, cannot cheat NPM when I'm offline. Okay, that's news. Okay, so. Hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop this and start this again. Never mind that, that's classic with uh, Windows, not GIP errors. Normally all this uh, happens in one step. I mean, uh, your NPM install runs, then your Bower install happens, and Bower is intelligent enough to take from cache and not download every time. So once uh, Bower install is done, then there is a gulp install task which wires up you know wires up everything and makes your application ready so gulp install uh, okay so while it starts let me start up uh, the app what is generated so i'll just run gradle w here uh, we ship with the uh, Gradle wrappers, so you can directly use the wrappers. You don't have to have uh, Gradle, or even if you choose Maven, you, you, we ship the Maven wrapper as well. So let uh, Gradle start up. Uh, if you look at the source, you could actually see that uh, there is no XML configurations or of any sort. So, and if you look at the Java source, you could see that there is a your your app name dot java which is your app file you can actually run this uh, okay, I'll, I'll zoom that up you can actually run this off your id directly since it's a spring boot app okay my uh, gradle is almost ready Configuring my Twitter connection factory since I chose social login. Okay, that is ready. Since to make it good for the development as well, let me run Gulp Sir, which serves a browser sync uh, enabled uh, you know, proxy app so that you can do all your live reloads and stuff on the fly. So you don't have to uh, wait for your application to, uh, you know. I mean, you don't have to go and refresh your browsers if every time you change something. So that is done automatically for you as well. Okay, so our app is ready. As you can see, you have all the uh, account-related stuff. You have all the languages you chose. That's cool, right? Out of the box, you get all the languages. So we have around 25 languages. It's pretty much covered. So, yes? Uh, I chose uh, H2 for development. So this is running on a H2 database in memory. And f if you deploy in production profile, it would be using a MySQL database. You can, you can see all the uh, configurations. If you, if you look at your resources, there are some configuration files. You could see a, a development uh, YML and a prod YML, where your configurations are there. So basically, if you look at your dev uh, YML, you have H2 configured here. And for production, you have uh, MySQL. You just need to fill in your username and password here. So, so let me just log in. Since I chose social login, those stuff are there. But of course, you have to put in your keys in order for those to work. So I'm logged in. As you can see, there is no entities yet. We haven't generated any entities. 
but you have all the basic stuff like your you know settings your password and your session monitoring and all those stuff and of course the cool admin stuff you have user management out of the box you can provision users you can uh, you know assign roles all those stuff right out of the, out of the box and uh, you have a cool uh, websocket based uh, you know tracker so basically it tracks what your users are doing so if i'm if i'm to open up uh, you know something else or if i'm if i'm uh, if somebody else is using my account or something you can you, know, you can basically track uh, and if you're an admin you, you can basically track for all the users so that's cool and we have some good old uh, metrics uh, some nice metrics for your app and your health this is all uh, spring boot stuff actuator stuff we provide some nice ui on top of that and all your uh, spring boot configurations hell lot of configurations you can view all that here and of course you have uh, some user audits and dynamic logs you can actually uh, change your logs at run time you don't have to redeploy or anything that, anyway that is spring boot stuff and uh, you have nice uh, swagger api documentation for your app so that's nice so you you have all your swagger api documentation so this is all out of the box and since i am using h2 i even have my uh, database directly here my in memory database but of course you won't have that if you are using mysql or anything so this is not enough right this is not a blog app yet so let's go and build a blog app yes uh, at this point having chosen so many technologies is there a, does it generate some sort of checklist of all the next step you have to do manually so that you don't forget anything there is no much manual steps you have to do i mean uh, whatever business you have to do you have to do that we cannot tell you right what business steps you have to do but uh, configuration for example you said uh, you uh, okay, okay. that that you have to fill in password user i think ID, that is the only thing you have to do yeah you have to put in your database password yeah so but when you choose so many things and you have so many stuff uh, to configure to be very frank that is the only step you would most probably do <laughs> yeah so all are auto configured most of your things are auto configured and all the configuration there is a default configuration for everything except for your database username and password which of course you have to put in so once you put in your database configure i mean username and password everything is else is auto configured so most probably you wouldn't have to do any configuration unless you have a specific use case and most of most of that edge cases are documented in our documentation site so in most cases you wouldn't have to is that the document in jhips the Uh, we we have some in jhipster as well and yes there is standard spring uh, document as well so for the entities uh, there is an entity sub generator which you can use to create entities one by one but uh, in in a real world uh, use case we find it very difficult i mean i have built uh, real world applications with uh, jhipster as well but uh, it is very difficult to you know build lot of entities i mean if you have some 20 30 entities i mean some 10 15 you can make one by one but once it go, goes beyond that it's very difficult to do one by one so that is why we have come up with something called uh, jdl studio uh, of course we came up with our own domain language sorry about that but it's it's a it's a it's, i think it it is even simpler than your uh, you know normal uh, uh, entity uh, declarations or your uml syntax or whatever so we have this uh, jdl studio where you can actually design your uh, entities you will get a nice visual representation of that as well so you can use the uh, simple syntax and build all your entities so this is a sample which we normally load up when you go to the jdl studio so you have all your entities here uh, basically uh, a declaration is your you know a keyword entity with your entity name and your attribute name type and whatever validations you need like required min length all those stuff so you can even have enums and then you would you know you would declare relationships so this is a simple syntax which we have uh, developed so i have already uh, built our domain so i'll just upload that here so for this uh, blog application this would be the this is a very simple domain which i could have so this is as for the as the json the npt json file this is converted to that i'll i'll get there okay uh, 
this is very simple uh, uh, domain i mean a model it has only three entities but i just wanted to show you how how uh, this would be used in a real scenario i could have done this by hand as well but uh, so we have three entities we have blog we have tag and we have entry so these are the fields for blog we have name we have handle and for tag we just have a name and for entry we have title content and date so the types are there and validations required uh, are there as well then i am having my relationships here so the editor actually you know uh, uh, prompts you with auto complete it is actually easy to build using this then you know doing one by one hand and this is only an online version it's only an online so No, we don't save anything or like we don't save anything to our database or anything. This is whatever you do here is only saved in your local storage, and you can either download or you know upload that. It doesn't get saved in any of our remote servers or anything. So, so relationships uh, you would want to say uh, so we have a many to one from block to user, we have a one to many from block to entry, we have a many to many from entry to tag. Uh, just one thing you have to make sure when you are uh, you know, modeling something is that make sure your uh, uh, you know entities are in order of dependency so that say for example if if tag uh, entry requires tag make sure you put tag before entry so that when your database is uh, being created it doesn't fail so just make sure of that it is all documented in our uh, website under uh, jhipster uml you have a subsection called jdl where all these are documented so there are a few more options which you can define here so i can define my pagination rules so i can uh, i'm saying that uh, you know i need pagination for tag and entry but not for uh, blog and uh, i need dto mapstruct dto for all my ent entities and uh, i would like to have all my you know entities through a service layer so i'm defining a service implementation uh, model here so once i have this uh, model you can just download a jdl file and i'm i'm downloading directly into the app so it it stores as a .jh file so once you have this you can go back to the application and you can just do your jhipster oops your jhipster import jdl and you can you know give you a path so i am since i have it in the root i am just running with that and you can see all the uh, entities being uh, imported takes seconds sorry i am on windows takes few seconds <laughs> so it it prompts you that is a human thing it prompts you when a file when existing files are overwritten so all my entities are generated so i have all three of my entities and you can see that the uh, browser thing is doing its stuff already so your front end would have been already updated but we still have to compile a uh, compile the new java files created so just waiting for okay all the uh, gulp tasks are done so i'm just going to compile this one good thing about uh, the latest spring boot is that it does uh, live reloading for you so even like that that's cool like you can compile your new classes on the fly and it uh, reloads your application on the fly so let me wait for my stuff to finish okay in the meantime uh, let it let it load okay it's done so my application is reloading it's almost done almost there okay done and okay browser sync reloaded it bit too fast i guess okay so you can see all the new uh, 
entities here, my blog, tag, my entry. So let's go and create a blog. So let's create a blog here, call it user and assign it to user. Let's create another blog, admins blog. Call it admin and assign it to admin. So, okay, so let's go and create few tags. You can see I haven't touched any of the database stuff yet. I haven't done anything for the database. So all my tables are created automatically. All, all, all my tables are even managed automatically by Liquibase. Whenever you create entities, the tables are updated with the new tables. I mean, the new tables are created on the fly. So let's create few tags. Let me put in an Angular tag. Uh, let's be nice to Spring and put a Spring tag as well. Okay, so my tags are ready. I have to go and create my entries now. So yeah, that's cool. So let me create a post. Oh, but uh, not enough, right? I mean, if I'm doing a blog, I wouldn't want to have a single line where I could type in my stuff, right? So, so let's do some Bower magic. Uh, there is a small plugin called uh, Text Angular. So, I would just install that plugin here. So, it, it, it gives you a very nice, rich text editor based on Angular. So, it's nice to have. So that I can, uh, you know, compile my YCG blog. So yes, I have done that. And you need to add those to your app. Uh, so let's add it to our uh, our Angular module. Dot JS. You have to define the new added directives. And since uh, you are going to do some uh, HTML binding, you need ng sanitize as well. But that is included with Angular. But you anyway have to define it in your uh, uh, stuff. And let's go and replace the directive. So entry dialog dot HTML. So you can see that our content currently is just a input field because I selected string as the type. So let me just replace that with the new directive. So I'm just replacing the directive. Uh, remaining things are the same. The model, all those are the same. So yes, processing, yes, reloaded. Now when I go, I should have some, OK. One second, something didn't finish there yet. Okay, something wrong with my font awesome. So supposed to be icons here. Okay, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm having my rich text here. Okay, I forgot which one is for emphasize. I'll make it a pre. Let's tag it to admins blog. 
Okay, that's right. But my content is still uh, not HTML, right? So let's replace that to bind HTML as well. I have already uh, typed all those stuff here so that I don't have to do that again and again. I could use multi-paste, but I don't find it very intuitive at times. So this is simpler. Okay. Let me reveal that my entity. So I'm uh, I'm just going to replace my uh, table here. So there is a table. I'm going to replace that with the content here. Uh, nothing magical. Just some uh, HTML with some. So it looks better, and my HTML is rendered as HTML since there is a. If you notice, there is a ng bind. Yeah, there is an ng bind HTML on my content, so that my HTML is rendered now. So there is still one more one more problem. We we see all users posts. I can see admin's post and I can see uh, Singapore SUG's post. We have to have our own post, right? So it has to be some security there. So uh, if you look at the generated uh, Java site, you can see the repository, Spring repository, Spring data repositories. If you look at the blog repository, you can see a method already there. Find you find by user is current user. This is already generated by JVista because you defined a relationship to the user. So I'm just going to use this method on my service. Okay, so I'm going to my blog service. So currently my find all is just find all. It finds all. So I'm going to replace that with this method. Okay. And I have to do same for my entry as well, because my entry currently shows all. So in entry also, I have to replace that. But if you look at the entry repository here, you don't have that kind of method. You don't have a method where uh, the data is filtered based on your user. So because there is no relationship to the user there. So it's, it's not a direct relationship here. So but this is on Spring Data. So it's quite easy to write your own uh, query. So I can just uh, you know do these two lines, and it would do that for me. I could just put this. Uh, I would just add the imports, and now let my service use this method instead of the find all method. Okay, that's simple enough, right? Oh, let me go back and compile that. I I wish these things are faster. I think Maven is a bit more faster compiling stuff. Okay. Some awkward silence there. Yes. By the way, if you are wondering what console I'm using, it's Con EMU. Okay, so huh? So I now see only what I'm supposed to see, right? So I only see admin stuff, and if I'm going to create a new entry, then in the drop downs, I only see admin's blog. The user part is gone, and if I Sign out, sign in as user, I would see the user stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. So I'd see the user stuff. So that's almost a uh, basic blog app what we need, right? So how much did that take? Okay, so. That was how much is that, man? Okay, some 50, twenty to twenty-five minutes. Okay, so that's around one sixty-seven hours saved. I'm taking it one hour, not half an hour. So that's one sixty-seven point five hours saved, right? That's I calculated it as eighty-three cups of coffee. Sorry if you differ, and twenty more days for vacation if you want. So that's my six week, weeks reduced to 30 minutes. 
Yes. This is 1.5. Yes. Angular 2, not yet. It's on our roadmap for JHipster 4.0. This is 3.0. We haven't released 3.0 yet. It's supposed to be released this month end. Yes. How do you expect from the, if I want to add attributes to the user table? Because just on the platform. Yeah, yeah. Data, yes. How will you do that? Okay. Uh, if you want to add attributes to the user table, since the code is there, you can always go add uh, your new attributes to your domain and your uh, Liquibase. There is an XML for Liquibase. So you can just add to your domain and your XML and it will be in your uh, table. It will be, when you rerun again, it will be uh, updated to your table. Or you can use a you know, Gradle or Maven goal. We have a goal to d generate div divs of your table versus your you know, actual code. So it generates the divs and updates your tables. So you can do that as well. And uh, with uh, 3.0, we have introduced uh, the, I mean, we have upgraded the entity generator to have uh, features to edit an existing entity as well. That means when you run an existing entity, it will prompt you uh, with an option to either edit, I mean, add or remove, uh, you know, fields and relationships. So earlier it was not possible, but now we have added that. But still, we don't uh, expose the user entity to be editor editable via the APIs. You have to manually edit your user entity because it is a special entity for us because we manage a lot of stuff around the user. So if we, once we start exposing that, then people could add whatever, you know, so many different weird things to that, and everything will be broken. So it's better that you do your user entity uh, edits manually so that you know what you're doing. So uh, what exactly is uh, jhipster? Uh, I mean, uh, if you I think some of you would be familiar with what a yeoman generator is. It's a AP, I mean, it's a framework to write uh, SCUF folders, like, Application generators, you can basically write a generator for pretty much anything. And we use that to build jhipster, which creates a Spring Boot plus Angular application. And uh, currently, I mean, these are some of our stats. We have around uh, uh, 12K downloads in the last 30 days, some 3,600 stars, 200 contributors. Uh, we have 200K overall downloads, NPM, DevBox, all those, Docker, everything. 10K plus app generations per month and 12K unique users as of now. Sorry? How is it, how is it easy to delete the entity? Sorry? Suppose I want to delete the entity already existing. Okay, uh, we don't have a uh, sub generator or anything to delete an entity, but I would say if you are using Git, that's pretty easy for you. I mean, uh, if you are adding a new entity, you, you would have uh, added as a new commit, right? So it would be as easy as resetting your last commit. I mean, if you're using it, and we expect you to, uh, people to use some kind of versioning tool. So if you're, uh, you know, uh, doing it uh, as a serious stuff, definitely you would be having some kind of versioning tool. So you would have to depend on that. Because those are things which you have to manually take care of. Because you could have added all your, uh, you know, uh, custom stuff on your entity. It would be hard for us to detect all that and delete for you. So at core, uh, when you generate an application, these are the things which we uh, include as default. So it's based on, since uh, we are based on Spring Boot, so typically wherever we could use Spring, we would try to use that. And uh, so Spring Security, yes, AngularJS is by default, Bootstrap. And uh, with 3.0, you have options to actually, uh, you know, either skip uh, your client side or skip your server side. So you can actually skip all the Angular bootstrap stuff and just generate a backend app. So that facility is there. Then uh, we have moved to Gulp. Earlier we used to have Grunt and Gulp. We have dropped that. So, so now we provide just Gulp. And we use Bower for our front end uh, you know, uh, dependency management. Yes, we provide Swagger out of the box. We use Drop Wizard metrics. And we use Karma for our JavaScript uh, tests. Uh, we use browser sync for live reloading, whatever you saw just now. And if you, you know, if single page application is not sufficient for you, if you have to do a traditional multi page application, we provide time leaf support out of the box as well. So you can use that. And uh, we, if you're using, if you have chosen, you know, uh, SQL or MongoDB, then we, we uh, do all the spring data magic there. And uh, for SQL, yes, of course, Hibernate and Liquibase, and there is Cassandra option, which uh, we have our own code to do Cassandra stuff. And that's not it. So those are the base stuff. 
on top of that you have all these combinations to choose from i mean you can choose to build a uh, monolith or microservice or gateway i'll go into details of that on the second part of the session and if you are choosing microservice stuff then you have all the netflix stack there you have docker support you have kibana again if you are using microservice and you have option to choose maven or gradle you have you can enable sas and uh, you can enable uh, internationalization you can choose from our all our uh, predefined uh, languages so for all our modules whatever module we provide out of the box we provide translation along with that so there are users who have contributed translation for all these different languages so you only would have to add for your newly added entities you know whatever you have to write your own translation but again we provide the skeleton files for that you just have to update uh, the values there and for social login yes we use uh, we provide option of uh, session oauth or jwt we used to have xauth but we have moved to jwt for uh, token and we have option uh, elastic token the socket again for token socket uh, eh cache or hazel cache then for databases if you if you want sql you have oracle and sql services and if you want other like sql options the dc can add as well just have to make the configuration changes uh, then you have uh, mongodb and cassandra for mongodb and for testing you have gate name system and for practice so all these are configured based on your option so if you think that's a lot then we even have more there are a lot of sub generators so entity sub generator some of you might be familiar if you have if you are familiar with uh, jhipster that we used to rely on the entity generator to create entities by hand one by one now we have import jdl function and uh, you know an easier way as well then there is a service generator to create a spring service bean just a skeleton generator kind of thing then if you forget to i mean earlier we used to have language generator as a separate thing that you have to generate your application and then you have to go in and add your languages now during your generation you have an option to select your base language and add your additional languages if you forget to do that uh, or in you know some point of your application development life cycle if you want to add a new language then you can use this uh, language generator to add a additional language it would Uh, put in all the files required for that additional language to work all the json files and all these would be uh, uh, generated for you and we have a client and server generator as i said if you don't want a full fledged app if you just want to create a server side app you can use the uh, server generator it will just generate a spring boot server app without the angular and bootstrap part or if you just want an angular and bootstrap part without the uh, server thing you can use the client generator and for deployment we have sub generator for aws cloud foundry and heroku we used to have open ship but we have deprecated that uh, due to a lot of uh, api uh, issues and bugs so currently uh, aws cloud foundry and heroku is our first class uh, uh, cloud options okay if that is not still not enough we still have more we have modules so you can actually go in and write your own module if you want if you think something is not there in j hipster and you can write your own module for that or you can also you choose from all the modules which are already there so we have a marketplace if you go to our website you can see a marketplace here which lists down all the available modules so currently you have uh, lot of modules there i think around uh, uh, 19 modules there most of it from our core development team a uh, few from other contributors as well so this is like this is not managed by us this is not in the jhipster organization or anything you build your uh, modules you publish it in to npm just add a keyword jhipster module into your npm file and we show it here so it's as easy as that so you, if you whatever customizations you want to do you can do and with 3.0 uh we expose some apis from jhipster so that it makes it easy for you to build your own modules so say for example uh if i if i want react on top of you know instead of angular i want to use react so i can easily build a module to uh generate just the backend part using jhipster and put my put my own react stuff and of course that is something which i am working on currently it's uh you can actually see a react module here which is a work in progress so you can do your you can you can do your own stuff there if you want to change the front end you can generate your own so i'll just uh, show you a sample of how a module works let's say 
I want some cool bootstrap themes. Okay, so we have a module called bootstrap. Let me just force so that I don't have to answer to all the diffs. So basically, this what this module does is it 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 adds support, you know, uh, it adds support for a, a theme picker kind of thing, so that you can change your bootstrap and you know, bootstrap themes. You can choose from all the available bootstrap themes and you can, you know, change them on the fly. So I have just added that that. Uh, gulp add those new uh, JavaScript to the index. I think it has already done that. Okay, or oh, not yet? Okay. Okay. So it's there. So you can, you know, go ahead and play with your themes. So there are a lot of such modules. As there is a Bootstrap UI module, which adds a you know, Angular Bootstrap, sorry, a, a Bootstrap Material UI. So, so that's how modules work. You have a module for uh, entity audits. It gives you a nice uh, audit page for your entities. It does all the uh, entity snapshots similar to Inverse, but not exactly Inverse, something similar. So all those things are there. And if Still not enough. There is still few more things you can go and check out. If you if you are a traditional person who likes to do your UML, uh, you there is a project called JXtra UML within our org, where you can design your UML using you know GenMy model or Visual Paradigm or any of those UML stuff. You can import that from the UML. You can directly import as entities. It will generate entities from that. And if you want to uh, create your own module, there is a module generator for that as well. Yes, we have a lot of sub projects. And there is an incubator organization for us. It's called Hipster Labs, where all we do all our incubator projects. OK. OK, so maybe uh, you guys need a break, or you want me to continue. How is it? I think I can go for another 30 minutes, or maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> so how do you want, want to take a break? Can? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, fine. Okay, so, who, uh, okay, uh, I, uh, can I assume that most of you are familiar with microservices? Uh, most of you have heard microservices? Yes, right? Uh, the hip word. So, wherever you go, people would be like, everybody wants to do microservices for everything. Even for the blog app, uh, which we did now. Some people would want to do it, do microservices. So yes, I can have my tags as one service, my entries as one service. Up to them, fine. But there are some genuine cases for microservices as well. I mean, so you want to do microservices. Uh, how many of you have tried to do microservices? Great. I appreciate your patience and all those things. So. Anybody wanted to do microservices and is not willing because of the complexity in setting up and understanding initially? OK. Uh, I think, Depeng, you would be very familiar with microservices anyway. So, so uh, uh, then can I take that most of you are not very familiar with microservices? OK. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically uh, the idea of having separate services for each of your stand, you know, individual tasks so that you have separate services for each item independent. It's like uh, how you used to do EJB in the olden days kind of thing. So instead of RMI, you do all this uh, REST API calls. So you have separate services. Uh, here and there, you, you might have multiple nodes of the same service. You ha might have it in different networks, all, all sorts of com uh, combinations. And yet, you access all those through the same single gateway. And you know, you know all these services work together to provide a common uh, a goal. So that's kind of, uh, sorry if I'm, I, I was wrong anywhere. So that's, OK? OK. That's kind of what microservices does. And if you haven't tried that, uh, because it is complex to start up with, 
I mean, there are a lot of new concepts to learn. There are a lot of, I mean, you look at, uh, I mean, Netflix provides a very good set of, uh, you know, tools and, and frameworks to so start up with microservices. But as soon as you he hear the names of those, it wouldn't make sense to you because somehow they chose to name weird Greek uh, names or something for those. So by the name of it, you wouldn't understand. Still, uh, you start to read all those together, you would wouldn't still understand how all those fits in and where to put what. There are there are just lot of options and it's just difficult to you know start up and 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 uh, it would be great if someone you know gives you a skeleton uh, you know or or something that binds all this together right. So that is where uh, we are. That is what we are going to do with uh, 3.0 because in in JHipster 3.0 one of our main uh, uh, thing is that we are we have started to support microservices. So let me just show you. So uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with doc Docker? OK, uh, how many of you don't know what Docker is? OK, uh, okay. if you are from a Linux background, you, would, uh, you might be familiar with this. It's like uh, running a small virtualized environment within your, you know, within your container, I mean, within your uh, operating system. You can have standalone virtual uh, environments within your operating system. And if you are from other OS as well, you might be familiar with uh, uh, VMware or like, you know, virtual box kind of things. So it's basically virtualization. So uh, what Docker does is, uh, say, VMware kind of technologies, it virtualizes an OS for you. It gives an entire OS, virtual OS for you to work on. Well, but what Docker does is, instead of giving you an entire OS, it gives you a small virtualized segment with, uh, say, a single service or a single application or a single tool running in it. So all these, they, there could be multiple Docker containers running and interacting all together to give you common functionality or like, you know, or you can have a single war running in a Docker, you know, instead of, uh, so what Docker does is instead of giving you an entire heavyweight OS, it, it gives a small segment uh, with just what is required for your service to run. So it, it uses the underlying OS instead of creating a new OS image. So that is Docker. So what we have done is that when you have microservices, uh, building a microservice architecture, uh, uh, a properly working microservice architecture is a difficult thing. But even more difficult is once you have that ready, how do you deploy that? How do you, how do you effectively or efficiently deploy that and you know, make use of that in, in a production kind of environment? That is even difficult because, uh, and, and that is where we have combined uh, the Netflix OSS, uh, Spring Cloud, and Docker to provide you a, a nice and easy workflow so that you can uh, not only create microservices, gateways, and all these things with JHipster, but you can easily deploy that as well, even if you're a Docker newbie, even if you don't know what Docker is. I was a Docker newbie. Uh, I think uh, I started using Docker last week or something. I have never tried Docker. I, because I'm on Windows, I, 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 every time I, I would try to start Docker, something would go wrong, something, some issues. Uh, yeah, it, it works nicely with Linux and Mac, but Windows, it was just tough. So I gave up and, uh, you know, I, I, I was not going to touch there because we had Docker experts in the team who were taking care of stuff. So I didn't have to look at that. But for this, I had to use. So somehow I got Docker working on my Windows. So for me, as a Docker newbie, it was quite easy. So. Uh, we even have a generator which does it even easier for you. Say, say for example, I have this uh, project here. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So I have what what I have already done is I have created a small microservice uh, project. So I have a gateway which I generated using uh, JHipster. Uh, when I ran JHipster, you saw three options, right? Monolith, gateway, or a microservice. So I use the gateway option, answered few questions, and that is the generated app. I haven't touched that after that. And I generated two apps, uh, MS app one and MS app two, again using jhipster's mo uh, microservice option. I just generated. I haven't touched anything that. I, I, I wanted to generate. I didn't want to waste time generating all this here, because it, it will take uh, at least five minutes each. So, And then I have a Docker folder here. So that's it. So uh, if, I, if we go into the Docker folder, it's empty. I don't have anything here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a generator here. So 
sorry I am slow with typing. Okay, so what this generator does is it generates, okay, Docker has something called images, so Docker files. So doc, a Docker file is nothing but a description of what the image should do, what, what service it should host and what service it should depend on all those stuff. So what this, gen, okay, it's asking for application located. So my application is uh, one level up uh, from the Docker. So these are the applications. So I'm, I want to Dockerize all of that. That means I, I'm going to deploy all of them with Docker. So I want uh, ELK. If you know, if you don't know what ELK is, it's uh, Elasticsearch Log Stash Kibana Stack, which is used for uh, logs, uh, uh, monitoring of logs, monitoring of metrics, and all those stuff. Uh, you know, visualization. Kibana is a visualization framework it's used for uh, nice uh, GUIs of all your uh, stats and visualizations. So I need that as well because definitely for a microservice kind of architecture, you need some kind of monitoring so that you know what your services are doing, how it is performing, and if there is a issue, you get alerts also. ELK gives that kind of features as well. So I'm going to enable that. And uh, for this, I'm going to use the dev profile. So it has created some files for me. So if you, if you see, it has created a Docker Compose YML file, which is kind of a configuration, which uh, tells Docker to do, you know, uh, so which tells Docker what are the services available and stuff. And then you can see something called registry.yml. So registry.yml is nothing but, uh, okay, before that, let's, uh, when it is, I, I'll, I'll just run it, uh, then I'll go into the next and explain stuff, because the running takes a bit of time. So I need to do docker compose up hyphen D. So I'm basically going to start docker. So I'm telling docker to start up all the services. So I'll explain you what is happening here when it is starting. Okay. So for a microservice architecture, uh, basically you need uh, two important things. You need a registry, which uh, as the name says, it kind of registers all your services. So you, you might have one to n services, say you, you have your MS app one, MS app two, so on and so. All this needs to be registered somewhere, right? So, and uh, that is where uh, Eureka comes into picture. Eureka is a, a Netflix stack component, which uh, does this registry part for you. And you also need a config server, which uh, kind of, uh, you, you can think of it as a centralized uh, configuration uh, repository kind of thing, where all your configurations are managed, you know, all these things. So, so this registry is a very important piece of the microservices puzzle. So, and that is one of the uh, key component as well. So we provide the registry as a runtime. It is not generated because it need not change for each application and the options are not going to change. So, it is a pre-generated -gen uh, repo. We have a repo for registry. So it's kind of a runtime and we provide it as a Docker image. So when you start up Docker, this image is pulled and used. So you don't have to uh, download the registry or anything by yourself. And uh, for the registry, we have used Eureka and Spring Cloud Config Server, both together. So that forms a jhipster registry. And all, the, all of your configuration for production is stored in your Git repo. repo. Another important piece of your microservice puzzle would be your gateway, the gateway from which you would access all your services. Because if you are exposing all your services directly, then that is not kind of a microservice, right? So you, all your microservices would be exposed via your gateway. So your gateway kind of proxies everything to your microservice, and it also can act as a filter, it can act as a load balancer, you know, all, all those things. So what we have done is, we have, uh, we, when you generate a gateway, so you can use Microsoft, I mean, JHipster to generate the gateway. When you generate the gateway, we configure the AngularJS app, which acts as the front end for all your app. Then we use uh, Zul proxy. Uh, Zul is again from Netflix. So we use Zul proxy and ribbon again from Netflix for uh, load balancing. And all your access control, your user access control and your uh, role management, everything happens there in the gateway. And it has its own database for that. And it also does some uh, filters for your microservice. Say if you want to restrict your API usage, some you might have seen public APIs. They ha have uh, API usage restrictions for users, say 1,000 hits a day. Those kind of things we already provide out of the box. And we, ha we provide uh, security filters. All those are basic things we provide out of the box. So that is the gateway which, we, which you can generate using jhipster. So once that is done, then you can generate any number of microservices and host it behind the gateway. So how many microservices want and how you want them, it's up to you. Your microservices can have a database, can be without a database, can use any database. I mean, one microservice can be on MySQL, another can be on Mongo, another on Cassandra, that's up to you. So 
So the green part is all what you have to generate. And the gateway also, you can generate gateway, and you can use some of the options as well to generate the gateway. It is not a runtime. Only the registry is a runtime. And similarly, jhipster console, that is the monitoring part. So that is where we use Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana to provide a uh, you know, complete monitoring framework for you. And again, that is kind of a runtime. We provide that as an image so that you don't have to download or deploy. It, it, uh, Docker just pulls and does it for you. So this is the uh, microservice architecture, which we are uh, supporting with jhipster 3.0. And what I have done here is I have just started the uh, registry, and it has started an uh, Elasticsearch instance. It has started a Logstash instance. It has started my gateway app, which I generated. And it has started my both uh, microservices apps. And it also started the jhipster console. So if I go into uh, Kitematic, which is the UI for Docker, because that is where I would have to go and look at my logs. So you can see all these have started up. So my registry gateway is started. My console is started. My apps are started. And my registry is running. So now, how do you access this? OK, uh, in, in uh, Windows, uh, if you are using Linux, uh, Docker is uh, even more easier and more efficient because Works on just works on top of Linux. It doesn't have to create a virtual container or anything, since uh, the concept behind uh, Docker is a Linux specific thing. Uh, in Windows, it creates a Linux uh, box first and then runs on, you know, runs uh, inside it. So that is why I have to use uh, Kitematic and stuff to look at the log. So my services are up. So this is my microservice. So you can see my entities are listed here. Uh, my service one entity is hosted on my MS app one, and my service two entity is hosted on my MS app two. And since it's a gateway, you have an additional item here uh, under the administration, which is the gateway. So it, it shows what are your current routes. So currently, we have three routes, two of my microservice, and of course, your gateway again is an application. So application on itself, it can have, your, have, have its own entities and stuff as well. So that's a, that's a valid route as well. And if you, if you look at the registry, which is running on port 8761, so this is the uh, Spring Eureka registry. So it also shows the same apps, you can see. So all the apps are registered to the registry. And if you bring down one app, it automatically handles that and all those stuff. And your scaling is also handled if you you know, if you have multiple nodes running the same app, all those are registered and handled as well. So, if you look at uh, and user management is done only on the gateway. You don't have to manage users on each apps. It is done on the central gateway, and based on that, all other uh, apps would be authenticated. So, if I am authenticated on my gateway, then I am authenticated on my apps as well. So, you don't have to manage that separately. And if you look at the health uh, screen, you can see additional items. You can see health of all the microservice items, your discovery client, Eureka, your refresh scope, and your config server. All, all those can be seen as well. So say, say, say if I'm, I'm, I'm creating an entity here. Let's see. OK. Uh, I don't have a way to minimize this. Anyway, uh, let's look at MS app 1. You can see the logs, right? OK. So I'm going to create an entity here. It's a bit slow because of all the containers running. So test, test. OK. You can see it being created in MS app 1, right? So if, if you look at the, and if, I, if I'm going to service 2, then there is nothing here. So I have to go to MS app 2. So it is properly rooted, and you didn't have to do anything for that. So you, you just have to generate your apps, then run a Docker command for it to be instantiated, and everything is deployed to Docker, and you are up and running. And if you are on Linux, then you don't even have to go through this. Because here you can see that uh, 
the URL is not sorry it is not my local host URL because in Linux I am under another container Where is it hey. Sorry? It, it, it's, 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 it's independent, right? That, that's the purpose of microservice, right? If you want both to be interlinked, then you would create them as a monolith. This is um, the, the very purpose of microservice to have independent services, which doesn't have to do anything to each other, but serve some common goals. So, so if you have a, uh, say, a reservation system, you, your booking engine could be a separate service. Your check-in engine could be a separate service, you know. And and if you want really want to communicate there, then of course you can, you can you can do the communication. There there is no hindrance in doing that. But sorry, somehow my hey. okay, it's weird. Okay. <coughs> okay. So that's about microservices, and uh, yeah, where is my? So any. Okay, maybe later questions later maybe. So uh, for microservices, as I was telling you, uh, we provide the registry, we provide the console. Both these are runtimes. Uh, we have a dashboard, historic dashboard. It's still work in progress. That is why I couldn't show you yet. Uh, that would be to, that would be on your gateway. Uh, sorry, on your uh, yeah, on your gateway. And the Docker Compose is what I have shown you for your deployment part. And we have a JHipster OpenID Connect, which is again a work in progress, where we are uh, planning to provide OpenID Connect support as well. And uh, this would be the Kibana uh, dashboard. I couldn't show you the Kibana dashboard because on Windows, uh, still some problems. I, I couldn't get it to load. So this would be the dashboard, uh, which my friend gave me from his Linux, I guess. Yes. So all your JVM metrics are there, and all your uh, logs. Uh, here, so currently, out of the box, we provide uh, visualization for JVM metrics and your logs, and we provide uh, alerts. We configure alerts as well for uh, using Insta alerts. So all that would be configured. Okay, so that's about microservices. Um, for real world experience, yes. Uh, last time I wanted to talk about this, but I overshoot my time, which I'm going to do I, here as well, I guess. So I couldn't talk about that. So I, ha I mean, I have spoken about JHipster to many people, and uh, most of them would uh, tell to me that okay, JHipster is a good tool to learn things. Like you know, if you want to learn how to wire some stuff up, you can generate an app and see how it is done. So you can learn from that, and it's a good tool to do small POCs or demos kind of things. But it might not be a good tool to do an actual real-world app. That is what I hear. Even uh, some of my friends used to uh, ha have told me that. But uh, uh, where I'm working, uh, we have uh, successfully implemented uh, uh, production apps, very critical production apps, with 100 plus entities using JHipster, using that, that tool, uh, I think, uh, version 2.3 or something like that. That is when it was done. So we have successfully done that. And it, it has saved me, say, I, I would say around 40 to 50 percentage of my development effort. So, so, so uh, say, uh, my development time was say uh, around four months so it this this uh, saved me around uh, you know one and a half to two months work setting all these uh, all these things together and uh, wiring all these things and figuring out how to do certain stuff so the the base gives gave, gave me all what i needed and i just had to you know uh, uh, write my business logic and uh, my ui stuff of course uh, you you wouldn't want to go with the same ui which we you can use the admin part GUI. You might not want to change that. But of course, for your business, you would have to do your own UA, right? So two ways to go about it. Some people would like to build their own UA and keep all this as admin stuff, so that admin have a different UA to go and easily do entity CRUD and stuff like that. That is how exactly some people are using it. 
Some people might just you know, rework on the generated UI and make it look better. That is what I did. I reworked on the generated UI. I changed the themes to uh, uh, my requirement. And uh, that was good enough for me. So yes, that, uh, that app, is, uh, it's, it's into production. And it's, uh, uh, it was a very successful implementation. There was no delays or anything, because this has saved me a lot of time. So yes, I would definitely suggest for production use, yes. Uh, because definitely, I mean, anyway, for production, you are not going to get code and deploy somewhere. You have to write your own code. And definitely, most of the code, what uh, we provide is based on a collective wisdom of a lot of people. So I would assume that is definitely better than writing from scratch. So that way, yes. And if you have any questions on that, uh, real world uh, scenarios or anything, you can ask me. I would be happy to answer. Uh, do you support reverse engineering already done. Okay, till now we didn't have any kind of reverse engineering support. We have added the first step. The first step is supporting a custom table name. Because currently what we used to do is like if you uh, define an entity, say you call, generate an entity called blog, uh, or say, yeah, blog, the table name would be blog. So the, you, if you want to reverse engineer, you can always take your model and you can create that into a model and you can generate, right? You can, you can take your database, you can generate a UML out of it, right? You can generate a, I mean, you can create a UML model from your database, and you can use the UML model uh, with jhipster UML and to import the front end. Then once it is created, you just need to remove the Liquibase part and deploy, and it will work with your existing database. Because Liquibase takes care of all the database management. Once you disable Liquibase, we, would, we are, uh, with 3.0, we will be providing switches to disable stuff. Say there will be a switch called, uh, uh, switch in the sense it's a spring profile. So if you add, uh, say, prod, uh, comma, no Liquibase, then Liquibase will be disabled. Similarly, if you want to disable Swagger, there is a no Swagger. If you want to disable cache, there will be no cache. So that is something we are uh, working on. That will be part of 3.0. So you can use these to do that as well. And uh, we are going to support uh, custom table names. That means when you're generating an entity, you can provide a custom table name. So that is first step towards reverse engineering. Not quite fully automated there yet, but there is a way to do, of course. What's the release plan for uh, The plan, is to re uh, plan was to release by mid of this month. Uh, you know open source, how it works. So we are planning at least end of March or early April. How do you handle distributed transactions in like, microservices? Sorry? Distributed transactions in microservices? Distributed transactions in the sense uh, database transaction, right? Maybe or maybe not. No. What I say, for example, if you're talking about uh, database transaction, then uh, you are, uh, um, okay, consider you are having a same app in multiple nodes, right? That is same as how you would do a monolith in cluster. So, say, for example, maybe one service might be using uh, MongoDB, and another one might be using Oracle. Yeah, so, uh, okay. That kind of uh, transaction handling is not there yet. Across services is not there. Of course, within within a single service, and even if uh, multiple nodes of the same service, uh, already it would be handled by Spring and uh, the Spring transaction, and your caching will be handled by Hasselcast. It does pretty good uh, distributed caching. But if you are having uh, two services with different DBs, and if you want to handle transactions uh, between both, then I would say there is something wrong with the design, because you are you are having two separate services and expecting it to both to handle the same transaction. So monolithic. yeah, the, I would suggest you go monolithic there, because to me, that is not microservice use case. Because I wouldn't do a microservice use case if you know I had to do a transaction in, uh, I don't know, I'm not an expert in microservice. So maybe uh, any comments from microservice experts? What about service buses? Sorry? Service bus, uh, like messaging between surfaces when I want okay, to we, publish some messages. I understand. I mean, uh, we, we don't have support for that yet. So and, and if I'm not wrong, uh, this could be, uh, I mean, this is just a first uh, release of microservice support. So uh, we are not quite there on all the use cases of microservices. Uh, the plan is to provide, oops, the plan is to provide the basic uh, you know, architecture. The, so what I showed is a basic architecture that would be required for microservice. So the plan is to provide that, and what is the most basic needs first. 
uh, of course all these are like uh, say advanced use cases i would say advanced use cases so not not yet so but may, might might be in a pipeline we haven't started to discuss on our uh, you know 4.0 pipelines are the only plan for okay i have a uh, thing on that as well so the only uh, uh, plan for 4.0 now is to move to angular 2 with uh, typescript so this could be part of a 4.0 or this could be something in between uh, definitely once we have the microservice uh, things out then only then we would uh, you know start getting feedback from our users and only then we would know how to prioritize and what features uh, yes it, it could be there i'm not an expert on microservice as i said so uh, i cannot firmly say yes or no to you but could be there yes now with regard to microsoft special or strategic relationship with docker if you not the microsoft uh, you know uh, uh, client is there any different between like yours independent from those non independent that not knowing exactly what latest that they offered with the parties how would you know uh, certain things that you know maybe you may not be aware of so in your case for example, okay uh, quite frankly i lost you there <laughs> so Quite frankly, I couldn't exactly understand what you meant. So, having a strategic relationship, partnership with Docker. Okay, yeah, so Microsoft. Those parties, yeah, but those parties do not, and we are using from, you know, casual, you know, uh, adopters. Hmm. Is there any advantage or other things that not known between the parties that we could be assured that you know we are not left behind with those? improvements or innovation whatever uh to be frank i cannot answer on that because it has nothing to do with j hipster because yeah, yeah. yeah i mean I so that is something it is from your experience because uh, when, when you present a paper so to be frank i wouldn't know <laughs> <laughs> to be very frank i wouldn't know on that because as i said i am a docker newbie so and i'm i found it very tough to get it working on my microsoft <laughs> <laughs> oh yes so i don't know how to answer that so uh, <laughs> uh can i have a question on the entities itself yes if let's say i have a web service can i use j hitler to generate the entities from the web service call right? you mean if you have a web service okay uh, uh what kind of web service it's a rest service or soap service any kind okay uh uh okay I'm finding it difficult to visualize how you would uh, generate entities from a web service. Yeah. Supposing you got a URL for WSDL. Oh, okay, okay. A WSDL which defines an entity. I mean, we we are not supporting that yet. I mean, I I don't know I don't know if we will be supporting that ever because that's a very <laughs> unique use case. Uh, so, I mean, you could you could get and convert that to a, a, a JDL or a <laughs> no, uh, I mean, if you are talking about generating web services in JSTOR, yes, we have a. Okay, at least I. Uh, there are two uh, modules there. There is a Swagger uh, module, JSTOR Swag, Swagger module, which actually uh, generates based on Swagger. Uh, you know, your Swagger. Uh, uh, it, it generates Swagger clients based on your uh, spec. Okay, so basically, you can use that for your REST APIs. But for SOAP, I'm I'm working on something. I'm working on a sub module. to generate web services with soap uh, wsdl uh, even to do that i uh, people might think that i am old generation so <laughs> to to mention wsdl but still uh, since uh, i find it uh, a very common use case in enterprises and real world things so i'm i'm writing a module which would uh, actually generate web service skeletons and you know stuff based on a wsdl but you have to put the wsdl in a root uh, folder then it would uh, it would it would generate uh, uh, you know your uh, jaxb bindings based on that and it would uh, generate a conversion layer based with map struct so you can you can you can easily you know map your uh, jaxb bindings to your entities so that i'm working on uh, whenever i find time <laughs> to be frank whenever i find time because currently i'm very much occupied with the jeeps to stuff and my day work so uh, maybe uh, once 3.0 is out might be a bit free then maybe in one or two months is it open source yes of course uh, thanks make pull request 
or maybe I can publish whatever I have and if you want you can continue to work on that. So, so since we are on roadmap for 3.0, the I think I have already covered, uh, I have three more minutes I guess. So I have already covered on our most, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean the huge stuff, the microservices. Then other things are like uh, we are adding support for editing entities uh, with the entity generator. We have dropped uh, Grunt, we are moving to Gulp and uh, we are following John Papa's uh, style guideline for Angular which is pretty much standard nowadays. So those are the major stuff. There is a huge uh, restructuring of our code base, internal code base as well as what is generated, the Angular part. So people using older versions of jhipster, you cannot upgrade with the new version because it will be a breaking change. So you can only use for newer application because the entire uh, front end code is you know, kind of restructured. Back end, oh, yeah, yeah. Back end is still the same, the only the front end part. So those are the major things. Then there are a lot of improvements and fixes and stuff, minor features, lot of minor features. So that's all for the roadmap. So yeah. Uh, yes, I think you're happy. <laughs> okay. So, questions? Any more questions? Can you give us? Can you give us a source it's generated uh, just a peek? Sorry. The source. Yeah. It's generated the JHipster generated for us. Yes, yes. The the source is in our repo. You you. you no, no. I I mean the the source the, the project the generated project. Generated. Yeah. Pro I I want to see what surface it's created. What kind of. Yes, yes, generated project, right? Yeah, yes, it is also in our repo. If you go to the GitHub repo, right? Yeah, we have a sample for every option because basically that's how we test. So we generate a sample for every application so that, uh, so you can see here, there is a sample app for every option. So that is basically the generated source or you can just install and generate whatever you want. It's source code generated anyway, so yeah. Anything? Is anyone using this in production? I mean, you know, you already use this. I'm using, uh, I think uh, we have uh, two big projects in production and there are a lot of projects being built. There is a very huge project being built which will be in production soon. So that is within uh, my company. And I know people from other companies using it in production. I know very huge companies using this in production. Uh, I don't know. This is a very open forum. So, but yes, uh, it is in production. Huge companies are using. Some uh, they don't. Uh, they find it okay to accept. Some they don't because since we don't uh, have anything as. J hipster kind of thing. Once you generate, it's your own code. Even if you go show it to somebody uh, claiming to be your own code, uh, they would believe you because there is nothing to show that it is except for the image on the front page, which you can remove easily. So, yes. Any more questions? Yes. Is there any reason to uh, use Gulp other than Grunt? No, we were supporting both uh, Grunt and Gulp, uh, but uh, we found it. Uh, you know, uh, waste of time to manage, uh, you know, maintain both because it was uh, both both were not uh, doing anything differently. It was doing the exact same thing. So very similar way and for Gulp is better at that. So it is faster and simpler compared to Grunt. So we decided it's time to just uh, focus on Gulp so that we can spend more time on that rather than maintaining both. Whereas uh, we give support, we support Maven and Gradle because it's it's different. It's It's not doing the exact same thing the same way. So even the, from the language itself, it's it's different. But for Grand and Gulp, it's not the same. It's it's JavaScript. So yes. Uh, so will you wait for the release of Angular two uh, stable to release? Uh, yes, actually, uh, we are we are uh, we haven't found any huge adoption of Angular two yet. So people are still using Angular uh, one. So uh, it, it it may not be a good move to switch to Angular two now. So we would want to see first. Uh, if it is really adopted, then definitely. And, and currently, our plan is to uh, support Angular 2 from 4.0 onwards, so that currently we can concentrate on microservices, and then you know, because Angular 2 currently not uh, quite there yet. So, and it's a huge <laughs> learning curve. So suddenly we switch, and 
even uh, i pretty much uh, i know angular one uh, maybe uh, not an expert but somewhere still i found angular 2 very <laughs> yes. when you were implementing your project did you use say bdd and the front end UI testing i used the uh, gatling protractor was something new we added so when i was doing protractor and bdd was not there cucumber uh, so cucumber and uh, cucumber we use for bdd so sorry. Uh, so cucumber and protractor was added later so i couldn't use that but gatling yes i used and protractor it is actually uh, very good i find it very good because i was recently using it for some purpose so it's good actually good to run all your automated tests with the uh, browser and see what's happening and sit back and relax and you better really than writing manual selenium stuff and you really use that in your gatling i used uh, protractor I'm, bdd i haven't used because as, as i said this was added later so after this was added i didn't do any projects yet so so i think we are, my time is over so if you guys are patient and if you have questions yes you can sit and i'll answer if not we can conclude thank you so you should go and check out some of these videos as well uh, from matt rebel one of our core contributor so you can check the website for any most of the details we will try to cover most of the documentation as much as possible so yes thank you